Test, test, test. Check, check. Yeah, looks good. Looking good. Well, thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Gnostic Studies and uh, a couple, well, it was last week, I guess. We had a Q&A and we requested um, some some input on what kind of classes we should do next, what series we should study, what do people want to, you know, learn about, etc. And so we decided, based on viewer requests, to do Tarot and Kabbalah, Gnostic Tarot and Kabbalah. That's what we're going to start off with today. It's going to be uh, multiple series. We're going to jump into the material today just so that you know how to get to what we're studying. You go to the Gnostic Studies website, GnosticStudies.org, Kabbalah, Gnostic Tarot and Kabbalah, or Tarot and Kabbalah in the Gnostic tradition. And then you'll be looking at this page. We're going to look at this page today, and we're going to go into uh, more, another page, which I'll show you in just a sec, which is called Egyptian Origin of the Tarot. Next week we'll cover Path of Initiation, then uh, Gnostic Tarot, Gnostic Kabbalah, and the Authentic Path of Initiation, then we'll jump right into the Arcana and their corresponding letters. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, leave them in the comments area. We're here to, uh, to work with you and provide uh, this interactive situation. So without any, any further introduction to the introduction. Let's jump into it. So we're going to be primarily using the Gnostic Egyptian tarot. It's uh, This is a colored version. We also have a black and white version. This is another colored version. If you're interested in, in finding out where to get them, please email us and we can give you some recommendations of, of where to find them. Sometimes the term plates are used a couple hundred years ago when they would make um, images in books. They would have to carve them in reverse on uh, copper or wood, and then they would ink that, tap it on some ink, tap it on the book, and so they were called plates. Uh, so you may hear that term when referring to these, these um, cards. Glad to see people joining, and um, the the main thing we're going to discuss in this first class is how each tarot card is associated with a number and a Hebrew letter. The example we give is that the, the first card is the Magus, or the Magician, number one, and the letter is Aleph. Now... We're going to go into today how some people uh, associate and, and esoteric groups associate differently these numbers and, and Hebrew letters with the tarot cards. So that's part of what we're going to talk about today and why we use this specific system. And what we can do and what we mentioned last week is once we study the card and understand the card, then we can... Um, understand that what that is is a symbolic representation of the important points or an outline for understanding the significance of the letter and the number. So when we receive the number in meditation, we receive the number in dreams, our natural experiences, and even in the physical world, we want to be able to immediately jump to what does that number mean? What are, what are the symbols associated with it? So we're going to talk about that 
as well. Because all of this becomes very significant when we talk about the path of regeneration, the, the esoteric spiritual path, reconnecting with divinity, and what that means for us individually. Because what we're going to learn is what we propose to you is the language of symbolism. The language that we need in order to understand the deeper significance of the symbols or um, representations of uh, images, allegories, all of these things, so that we can reduce everything to its, its synthesis. We are mainly going to use three books. Spanish, originally Spanish language books, Manual of Practical Magic. We're, we only use Magnus Opus for um, the introductory part. So Manual of Practical Magic, Esoteric Course of Kabbalah, and Tarot and Kabbalah. Uh, we've got links here for the books. Again, um, if you want links for cards, let us know. And we'll pass that, we'll pass you the, the information that we have. All right, let's jump into the first class. Egyptian origin of the tarot. Uh, there's, there's some people that say that the tarot comes from Egypt. And there's others that say that that's, uh, hogwash, right? And let's remember that everyone is entitled to their opinion. What's important is not opinions, but facts. We should study facts. Let's look now at what Eliphaz Levy, one of the people who created or began, initiated what we now could call the new, um, new age of esotericism, studying different languages, different um, systems, Christianity, Judaism, um, indigenous, European indigenous tradition, Eastern traditions, Hinduism, um, East Asian, and, and through that, wrote some very interesting texts. What he said was that the tarot plates were derived from Egyptian hieroglyphics. And he even says somewhere, I don't know if we quoted it uh, on this page, that uh, if you go and look at the, the temples and the buildings that they have in Egypt, then you can see them. It's an interesting idea. Personally, have not yet been to Egypt, so I haven't been able to check that out. But all this is from a book called uh, Kabbalistic and Occult Tarot of Eliphaz Levy. The introduction is useful for us. It introduces us both to Levy's... Um, ideas as well as to his sort of esoteric goals. He says in the preface of his History of Magic, 1860, that we should carefully study his three books, Dogma and Ritual of Magic, The History of Magic, and The Key to the Great Mysteries, in order to get a complete course on the science of the ancient Magi. So, uh, you know, that's Magi refer to not only those so-called uh, wise men who visited the Christ child in uh, Christianity, but also to those ancient um, initiate priests in the uh, Zoroastrian tradition in the Middle East. 
So this is a, a direct quote from Levy's books. He says, Our discovery of the great mysteries of this science rests entirely upon the signification that the ancient hieroglyphs, I'm sorry, the ancient hierophants, a hierophant is a instructor of the mysteries. Let me read it again. Our discovery of the great mysteries of this science rests entirely upon the signification that the ancient hierophants attached to numbers. Because of the importance of the symbolic value of numbers, it follows that numbers are equivalent to letters, symbols, or figures which represent some principle or principles. Quoting again from Levy, There is subject to believe that this comes from the ancient manner of explaining by numbers and by figures, as were the hieroglyphics among the Egyptians before letters were invented. It doesn't mean that there weren't symbols prior to that, but letters in the sense that you use letters to make words. Symbols can incorporate more than just uh, a word. The absolute hieroglyphical science has as its foundation an alphabet in which deities were represented by letters, letters represented ideas, ideas were convertible into numbers, and numbers were perfect signs. The hieroglyphic alphabet that was the hieroglyphic alphabet was what Moses used to make the great secret of his Kabbalah and which he took from the Egyptians. Again, that's Elphas Levy's opinion, right? It's an interesting idea because we know that the Judaic peoples passed through Egypt according to um, documents religious documents. All religions have preserved the remembrance of a primitive book from the earliest centuries of the world written with figures by the sages, and from which these symbols, simplified and vulgarized later on, have provided writing with its letters, provided the verb with its characters, and provided occult philosophy with its mysterious signs and its pentacles. This book attributed to Enoch, the seventh master of the world after Adam by the Hebrews, to Hermes Trismegistus by the Egyptians, to Cadmus, the mysterious builder of the holy city by the Greeks, this book was the symbolic summary of the primitive tradition, called since then Kabbalah, or Kabbalah, a Hebrew word which is equivalent to tradition. The doctrines of Hermes can never be lost for those who know the keys of symbolism. The symbolism of numbers and the allegory of figures easily gives the key to the poetry of the prophets, as those from the past knew who were versed in Oriental literature. These Oriental traditions are incontestably extremely ancient. The prophets often spoke through signs and hieroglyphics and put their words into action. Their writings were full of figures, which could seem strange to those who do not penetrate their meaning. Beautiful poetry is exactly what we call true philosophy, and that poetic measure obeys, like geometry, the laws of number and of comparison. Great poets are mathematicians without knowing it, since the incontestable beauty of their production is the result of their exactitude. Let me read that sentence to you again. Beautiful poetry is exactly what we call true philosophy, and that poetic measure obeys, like geometry, the laws of number and of comparison. 
Great poets are mathematicians without knowing it. Since the incontestable beauty of their production is the result of their exactitude. Words are the numbers of thought, and figures are the algebra of genius. There is only beauty in that which is true, and that which is true is just or right. Rightness or accuracy in literature is exactitude, and exactitude is the property of the mathematical sciences. Therefore, the good poet is then a venerable mathematician. To be a poet is to create. It is not to dream nor to lie. God was a poet when he made the world, and his immortal epic is written with the stars. Uh, you know, it's translated as he, but it doesn't have to be male. Um, obviously, the divinity is beyond those divisions. But just to clarify, the sciences have received from God the secrets of poetry because the keys of harmony were delivered into their hands. Numbers are poets because they sing with notes that are always exact, which gives rapture to the genius of Pythagoras. Poetry that does not accept the world such as God made it and which seeks to invent another is but the delirium of the spirits of darkness. I'm just going to check, see if we have any more uh, comments. Please feel free to drop them in the comment area if you do. Questions or comments. <clears throat> Going further, Levy says that we must be careful of the danger of literal interpretation of symbols. Because oftentimes, this misses the point. Words, numbers, and figures have their mystery, which explains how the letter kills while the spirit vivifies. Sometimes it's said the spirit gives life. The letter kills while the spirit gives life. Does anybody understand what that means? Can they explain it to us? What does it mean that the letter kills while the spirit vivifies? Well, I'll give you my opinion for what it's worth. When we write something down, or as it said in Taoism, when you give something a name, then it sort of fixes it, and it can only be in that way. But when we understand the spirit of, of what was written, the meaning behind it, then it doesn't uh, sort of solidify it in the same way. It's, it's still alive. But when we tie it down by, by giving it an exact definition, then we often uh, kill it in the sense of we limit it. Almost all popular superstitions are profane interpretations of some great axiom or some marvelous arcanum of occult wisdom. Did not Pythagoras, in writing his admirable symbols, devise a perfect philosophy for the wise and a new series of vain ob observances and ridiculous practices for the vulgar? Thus, when he said, Do not pick up what falls from the table, do not cut down trees on the great highway, do not kill the serpent which has fallen into your garden, he was not giving I'm sorry, was he not giving the precepts of charity, either social or personal, under transparent allegories? And when he said, do not look at yourself by torchlight in a mirror, was he not teaching in an ingenious manner about the true knowledge of self, which does not know how to exist with artificial lights and with the prejudgments of systems? It is the same with the other precepts of Pythagoras, who, 
as it is known, were followed literally by a flock of stupid disciples. To the point that among the superstitious observances of our provinces, there are a great number which apparently originate from the primitive misunderstanding of the symbols of Pythagoras. Superstition comes from a Latin word which signifies survival. It is the sign which survives the thought. It is the cadaver of a religious practice. Superstition is to initiation what the idea of the devil is to that of God. It is in this sense that the worship of images is forbidden and that the most holy dogma in its first conception may become superstitious and impious when it has lost its inspiration and its spirit. It is then that religion, always one like supreme reason, changes its clothes and abandons the ancient rites to the greed and deception of fallen priests, transformed by their wickedness and their ignorance into charlatans and puppeteers. So we need to study the, the symbols in order to understand their poetry, their, their spirit. And luckily these are available to us in the form of the tarot. Now the tarot that we have today has come to us from Egypt, passing through Judea. The keys of this tarot, in fact, correspond with the letters of the Hebraic alphabet and some of its figures even reproduce the same form of the characters of this sacred alphabet. So again, that's Levy's opinion. We're going to go into it here. We'll see what else he has to say about it. Uh, if you want info for cards, you're going to have to email us, uh, gnosticstudies at gmail. Uh, that was, I see somebody answered here online that uh, the letter draws it down into matter. That's another way to put it. That's another way to say it, that the, the, the letter kills but the spirit vivifies, right? Like it, it materializes it. So again, this information is from the, the book, uh, The Kabbalistic and Occult Tarot of Elphas Levy. Uh, that's where these tables and this information is coming from was compiled together so we just reproduce it here on the website so if the tarot corresponds with the Hebrew alphabet which is what he's saying then we should study the numeric and Kabbalistic significance of the Hebraic letters in order to grasp the symbolic value contained in them one of the first things one will notice when studying the Hebrew letters is that they correspond directly to numbers. And then it becomes clear that these letters, which are also numbers, are directly related to the tarot cards. So, in Hebrew, you don't have numbers. Letters are numbers. If you need to say one, you can use the first letter Aleph for that. And Pardon my uh, Western pronunciation of these names. If you need to say two, bet. If you need to say ten, yod. So here are uh, Elphas Levy's tarot card names and the corresponding Hebrew letter. The juggler. Right, le, le battleur is what the French is, which sort of means juggler, means sort of like a street performer as well. Um, maybe like an acrobat or a, a, a fakir, something like that, like a gymnast could be. But uh, in English and um, Spanish, they use the, the term magician or magi for that card. Right, so the, the information is there. It's also available at the bottom of the um, 
web page that we're reading from, which has the a handout that was requested last week because it contains uh, some Gnostic associations, including these. So anyway, this information is from Alphonse Levy's book from 1856, I believe, Ritual of High Magic. And what you'll notice is that everything corresponds exactly, the num numeric value corresponds to the Hebrew letter, and that corresponds to a tarot card. So Levy attributes the Hebrew letters to the tarot cards based on the Hebrew alphabet. And this can be seen in chapter 10 of his Dogma of High Magic, in chapter 22 of his Ritual of High Magic, as well as in uh, the manuscripts, which has, or the manuscript that's been called the Magic Ritual of the Sanctum Regnum, given to his student and later published in 1896 and translated into English. Um, the, it's also in the book that this uh, information is coming from. The correspondence of the Hebrew letter and number to the tarot cards has been a cause for confusion for many Kabbalists, and most often this is because the last two tarot cards are the ones that are confused, although plenty of other deviations are also perpetuated. So we're going to look at these last two and why they're associated with uh, with the numeric values. The last two have been altered to conceal a mystery related to the symbolism of the Hebrew letter Sheen, the 21st letter. This is the 21st tarot card, sometimes given a value of a zero as well. Levy has explained this mystery, it's the mystery of the Great Arcanum, in his books, and it is summarized in the statement that he gives in chapter 10 of his book, Dogma of High Magic. For the letter Sheen, he says, Where the mortals who lack a break descend in herds. Right? A break meaning they can't slow down, they can't stop themselves. The mortals who cannot stop themselves descend, or maybe in Gnostic. Um, explanation we would say fall. Mortals who lack a break fall in herds. Herds are animals, groups of animals, right? So there's wisdom there. You can see the, the card here. We'll, we'll see his description of it. The 21st Hebrew letter, or the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Sheen, and, cor and the corresponding tarot card the lunatic or the fool is sometimes given the value of zero instead of 21. I'm just going to check out these, uh, see if you guys have any comments. Okay. Careful study of the symbolism associated with Sheen will explain why zero might make sense for this letter individually. Although this value causes confusion with the letter that follows, Tav, and therefore becomes problematic when used along with other letters. This is the tarot card for Tav. The 22nd and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Tav, and the corresponding tarot card, the crown, or the world, sometimes it's also called a return, the return, is given the value of 21, so instead of 22. When zero is given to Sheen, so here. If they give Sheen the value of zero, the lunatic, because obviously is a, a fool or a lunatic has a value of zero, right? It means we're not able to progress. It's a, a lunatic or a fool symbolizes a person who's not able to to make progress on their own. It's important to understand. Yes, there are people who call other people fools who are not fools, but the symbolism in and of itself of a lunatic or a fool is someone who is, is wasting resources and, and doesn't understand the correct value of things. So 
it makes sense that this card could be given the value of zero. However, when we do that and we leave Tav, the next card as the value of 21, then things can get confused. Further confusion has been caused by a complication of the previously mentioned misassociation of Tav with 21. Since the card for Tav, the crown or the world, has been known as 21, when the card for Sheen, the lunatic or fool, is added back into the deck, it mistakenly becomes the new 21. I'm sorry, the new 22. It goes at the end, and sometimes they'll put it also at the beginning and leave it with the value of zero. And this is common in many tarot cards, that these two are flipped, that the crown is 21 and that the lunatic is 22. But what we're trying to point out is that this is not what Elphas Levy has done when he uh, did his tarot, when he introduced the study of the tarot to the West in an esoteric, occult way in his Kabbalistic system, which was then developed by a few others to a, a richer, uh, very powerful system that can be used for us to understand the language of symbolism. So the solution of all of this is to remember that we need to use the alphabetical ordering. And that alphabetically, Sheen is 21 and Tav is 22. That way we don't get confused. And that's what we initially gave here. Sheen is 21, Tav is 22. The alphabetical ordering is what Levy uses in his books, and therefore it's what we use, well, it says in the study guide because we copied that, this from the book, but the same thing we're going to study. And he, here's what Levy says. We have said that the 22 keys of the tarot are the 22 letters of the primitive Kabbalistic alphabet. He said, our dogma and ritual, which refer to his dogma and ritual of high magic, the two volumes of a, a, a book that he made, are each divided into 22 chapters marked by the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. We have put at the head of each chapter the letter which is related to the Latin words, which, according to the best authors, indicate the hieroglyphic signification. This is from 1850s again, him explaining this. Thus, at the head of our first chapter, for example, we read 1, the Hebrew letter Aleph, the letter A, recipient, disciplina, ein sof, keter, which signifies that the letter Aleph, whose equivalent in Latin and French is A, the numeric value 1, signifies the recipient. What's a recipient? What's a recipient? Sometimes it's used to describe a, a vessel, but it's always used to describe someone or something that receives. Now let's understand this. His description of the recipient is the human being called to initiation. In another uh, a French text from a similar time period, there's a, uh, it's about um, Freemasonry. There is a footnote that says, before a candidate passes the initiation in Freemasonry, they're called the recipient. They're receiving something but they haven't necessarily passed the tests, the ordeals, in order to be considered an apprentice or um, 
companion or, or master as, as the, uh, the initiations are in Freemasonry, French Freemasonry. So this also corresponds to the skilled individual, which is le battleur, the juggler or magician of the tarot, which also signifies the dogmatic solipsis, disciplina, the discipline, the being in its general and first conception, the Ein Sof, he's talking about Kabbalah, and finally the first and obscure idea of divinity expressed by Keter, the crown, the first uh, Sephirah of the Tree of Life. So these are the symbols, the words that are used to symbolize the first tarot card, which symbolizes the Hebrew letter Aleph, which corresponds to our A, and the number one. So he's, he's explaining the tarot already here, and he says that's why he put these at the beginning of the chapter. And each chapter is the same. It has its corresponding letter, number, and words, key words. He says, the chapter is the development of the title, and the title hieroglyphically contains the whole chapter. The whole book is composed following this combination. If we look at the chapters of Dogma of High Magic, we see that chapter 21 is associated with the letter Sheen and 22 with Tav. So we're just emphasizing this, right? Because people will tell you that's not what he uh, thought, that's not what Levy thought, and other people will tell you, you know, no, that's wrong. But if you study his material, then you know that Levy knows things. He understands things. And uh, again, my, my point of uh, using him is that he's the one that really began comparative study of religion, popularizing it in, uh, in the West for, for many, many people. Inspired Blavatsky, and, who then inspired um, people like uh, Rudolf Steiner, many, many others, right? It sort of began through him. So in uh, chapter 22, of Ritual of High Magic, which this 22nd chapter, he said, the Book of Hermes, he gave that as, as the title. He gives, among other things, description of all 22 Hebrew letters and their hieroglyphics. And this is what he gives for Sheen, for this tarot card you see below. The lunatic, a man dressed as a lunatic, walking aimlessly, burdened with a satchel which he carries behind him, and which is no doubt full of his follies and vices. His disorderly clothes allow the discovery of what should be concealed. Something that should be concealed could also be called something that is uh, secret or private. Take a look. Let's see if we can get this open in a new tab. Take a look here. A cat or an animal is going for the uh, creative organs, right? His disordered clothes allow the discovery of what should be concealed. And a tiger who follows him also bites him without him wondering how to escape or defend himself. On this one, you see him walking off a cliff, similar here. Here in the background, it's a little bit hard to see. There is a crocodile, a broken um, obelisk. He's not paying attention at all to the animal attacking him. Very esoteric symbol. Uh, uh, very deep esoteric symbolism, I should say. And in chapter 22, 
He also describes the figure of the crown of the world, again associating it with Tav. He says that this card represents the universal arcanum, the final and eternal secret of high initiation is represented in the tarot by a naked girl who touches the earth with only one foot, has a magnetic wand in each hand, and seems to be running in a crown held up by an eagle, I'm sorry, an angel, an eagle, a bull, and a lion. In the introduction to Ritual of High Magic, Levy says the following. Here, Fabre d'Olivet is just missing the true interpretation because he is ignorant of the great keys of the Kabbalah. The word Nahash, explained by the symbolic letters of the tarot, rigorously symbolizes, for letter, 14th letter, Nun, means the force which produces mixtures, the fifth letter, He, the recipient and passive producer of forms, <clears throat> and the 21st letter, Sheen, the natural fire and central equilibrium through double polarization. Again, Levy gives 21 as the numeric value of Sheen and associates the letters of the tarot with the Hebrew letters. Whosoever wants to achieve an understanding of the great word and possess the great arcanum must, after studying the principles of our dogma, read the Hermetic philosophers carefully, and he will doubtless attain initiation, as others have, ad have attained it. But one, must take but one must take as the key of their allegories the unique dogma of Hermes, contained in his emerald tablet, and follow in order to classify the knowledge and in order to direct the operation, follow the order indicated in the Kabbalistic alphabet of the tarot. So we, we've tried to establish that Levy uses the alphabetical association of Hebrew letters and numbers with tarot cards. Let's study the wonderful book the original book of the ancients that synthesizes their profound wisdom letter by letter in order to access the secret science that is contained within. The science of signs begins with the science of letters. Letters are absolute ideas. Absolute ideas are numbers. Numbers are perfect signs. In using ideas with numbers, one can operate upon the ideas like one can operate upon numbers and arrive at the mathematics of truth. The tarot is the key of letters and numbers. Each letter represents a number. Each assembly or assemblage of letters is then a series of numbers. The numbers represent absolute philosophical ideas. The letters are abbreviated hieroglyphics. Now let's see the hieroglyphic and philosophic significations of each of the 22 letters. So we're not going to go into that today. Uh, that's in the upcoming classes that we'll study that. But that information is, uh, or this information, we've got a handout at the bottom of the page here that you can download. This is what the handout looks like. It's a PDF for the first class, linking back. So if you ever needed to go back uh, and look at the material, synthesis of what we talked about today, the poetry of God. These are uh, these are the numbers the a version of the modern Hebrew letters, and these are older Hebrew letters that were said to be descendant from the uh, writing of the stars.
Next week we'll read chapter 85 of Initiatic Path in the Arcana of Tarot and Kabbalah. Here we've got a table that was requested last week. It's got the letter, numeric value, the Kabbalistic value, the modern Hebrew shape, the modern Hebrew name, uh, other letters from, from other Semitic languages and uh, associated hieroglyphic. And then the Gnostic Association in the tarot card, as well as a, a symbolic symbol or Gnostic symbolism or meaning that goes along with the letter and the number. So again, according to Gnosis, tarot cards are hieroglyphics, which can then be reduced to a Hebrew letter, which can be reduced to a number. When we understand numbers, the tarot card itself serves as a mnemonic, as a, a symbolic or uh, figure representing the, uh, the principles uh, of, that sim of the symbolism of that letter, the principles of that letter, which is a number. We'll, we'll talk about it more, but as we mentioned in the previous uh, class, for example, the Hebrew letter Aleph, the first card, corresponds to the, the number one and corresponds to the magician. Let's see if we can get a bigger picture of this one. All right, so the magician, in some cases, the card will even take the shape of the letter. But he's got this interesting hat, which we'll see is related with the infinity sign, which we studied when we were looking at um, dream yoga in the astral world. He has a wand in his hand, and he has uh, a cup, a sword, and pentacles on the table, which are related with the four elements, meaning that he dominates the four elements. He dominates matter, because the four elements are the synthesis of matter. Beneath the table, a flower is growing, and he also has his uh, right arm down and his left arm up, which you can also see represented here. And here, and these other two cards. And in the Gnostic Egyptian one, you see the same thing. But instead of a flower, they have a bird under the table. This one has a flower, this one is missing it. And in this card, the, the uh, infinity sign is represented by the eyes of Ra. All right, so that's the material that we wanted to present to you. We want to open it up for questions or comments now. Um, let's see here. So there's a question here, is, is not the zero the first card and the last 21? That's, that's what this whole class was about, was to say that no, it is not, that sometimes, uh, and, and I'll, let me bring up that page so that you can uh, see. Sometimes what happens is that the 20 uh, first card is given the value of zero because it is a fool, the fool or the lunatic whose progress is equal to zero. It means we don't make any progress. We're unable to make progress because we don't understand the value of things. We don't understand how to use resources. And the symbol for that is given here. The lunatic. A man dressed as a lunatic. Walking aimlessly, burdened with a satchel, which he carries behind him, and which is no doubt full of his follies and vices. The follies and vices, obviously, are what make him a fool or a lunatic. His disordered clothes allow the discovery of what should be concealed, right? His privates, what should be concealed, something that is private. And a tiger, or in this case, a uh, cat, sometimes it's a dog. Here we've got a crocodile. Bites him, 
without him wondering how to escape or defend himself. In some of the symbolism, you see he also is walking off of a cliff, right? He's going to fall. As we mentioned, uh, Levi describes it in other ways, saying that, uh, according to Levi, chapter 10 of Dogma of High Magic, Sheen, the 21st letter, is where the mortals who lack a break, that is the ability to stop themselves, descend in herds. Herds are animals that uh, fall, or in this case we could say fall instead of descend. Okay. So we don't start with zero, we start with one. Uh, and that's one of the mistakes that happens when uh, looking at the, the tarot cards, is that they associate zero with the Sheen card, and then they move that card, the Fool, to before Aleph, and then it goes, the, the Hebrew letters are out of order. And that's why we, we uh, are quoting this uh, document, because it assists in understanding that need for keeping them in the proper order, and that's in fact what El Fas Levi did. Uh, we're not getting caught up in numbers because uh, numbers are, as Levi says, perfect signs. We need to understand the meaning of numbers. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them. There are many that say that the fool is the first step in the journey. And, you know, that's part of what we wanted to talk about today is that that's incorrect. We cannot start off as a fool. We have to start off as a conscious human being, a, a human being that's trying to take advantage. It's trying to use their willpower. That's how we actually progress, not being a fool. If you have any more questions or comments, please uh, drop them into the comment area. Fool and wise is very similar in energy, is a comment. Um, I disagree. The, the implication, if we look up the definition of fool, it is the opposite of, of someone who is wise. It's someone who's, again, wasting resources, someone who doesn't understand the value of things. Whereas a wise person does understand the value. We're not saying that society understands the value. But we're talking about initiation. We're talking about esotericism. We're talking about the esoteric teachings, the profound teachings of how to reconnect with divinity. So the perspective that's coming in is not the perspective of the masses, but the perspective of the initiate, the, the esotericist. So that is who is determining what is wise and what is foolish, not the masses. So the perspective is, is coming from how to get closer to divinity. So that's why those terms are used. Because when we understand it from the perspective of the uh, esotericist, the, the Gnostic, the person who's trying to reconnect with God, then we understand the difference between what God considers a fool, what God considers a sage or a wise person. All right, well, what we're going to do is uh, we'll, we'll pause there. And uh, we'll jump into the next class next week, which will be, uh, to give you a little a preview of it, we're going to look at the path of initiation, talk a little bit about Gnosis, what the path to return to God, right? Sometimes they call it the crown of life, the Arcanum 22, the world, we, they also call it the return, 
which implies the return to divinity, reconnecting with divinity, which is possible through the authentic path of initiation. So we'll talk about that and, um, and what the, the three obligatory steps of initiation are. Imagination, that is learning to use our imagination in a conscious way. This is not the same thing as what we call daydreaming or um, mechanical imagination or fantasy. But we're talking about, maybe sometimes they call it creative visualization, right? Being able to visualize something and work with that. It's very useful in meditation. Because once we understand the language of symbolism, this allows us to become inspired. Inspired about the work we need to do. And the next step is to activate our intuition so we can intuitively know how to stay, how to remain on the path. Well, that's it. We're going to uh, call it. So thank you guys very much for your participation. And uh, we wish you the best in your esoteric work. And we hope to have you join us next week.